So Phoebe Philo has dropped um, a new batch collection of uh, ready-to-wear stuff that she's been putting out recently now for a namesake label. I think this might be collection number four or five. I'm not really too sure what it is. Um, to be fair, she's not doing seasonal collections. She's doing, no, it's kind of seasonal, but it's two drops a year. Wh whatever, right? Um, either way, I just love the fact that she's back in fashion now um obviously i've been a big fan of her um you know since the get-go most of you are aware of her because of her fucking you know phenomenal run legendary um you know tenure over there at celine but now she's doing all of her things on her own namesake label and i feel like the name phoebe fellow carries so much weight that it's kind of cool to see her making things under her own name and then also imagining this stuff in people's wardrobes or imagining people wearing garments with like the name tag with her name on it do you know what I mean it's just like a cool concept to kind of think about stuff and obviously she's kind of changing the way she's kind of doing fashion no big retailers it's all direct to consumer like most streetwear brands have been doing for, from the beginning which is kind of a weird thing in itself fashion brands find it very odd or it's, it's always a it's, it's such a it's such a unique and big thing if a designer decides to sell their wares directly on their site they, they, you know, fashion brands or fashion companies or broadsheets or press or media make such a big deal out of it, right? Because most companies don't do this. Most brands, most fashion brands decide to sell in big retailers, big stores and whatnot. Um, obviously, Phoebe Fowler's doing it all direct um, and whatever it may be. No big fashion shows or whatever and everything you just kind of see online. So a lot of the stuff um, has been selling out. A lot of the stuff has been kind of garnering a lot of attention online, especially stuff like this like the scarf pillow a lot of people have been really kind of you know i'm um, laughing at and kind of scoffing at because of the price it's a pillow it's basically a scarf you know with a pillow inside it um that's kind of made in this really nice cream ivory kind of silk type of or satin type of material and that kind of works like a one of those kind of wraparound kind of pillows you wear around you know, at the airport there's some really cool shoes really cool shirts nice bags nice belts nice shoes accessories and um, the styling is amazing this is one of my favorite pieces actually and um, this padded jacket um with the gartered waist in black that jacket is absolutely phenomenal but a lot of the stuff i really love a lot of the stuff i really like really minimal really simplistic um but again extremely luxe and um, this is what you would describe as being quite luxury you know the, we've got some soft ballet flats here for 690 dollars we've got some hand combed embroidered tailored trousers for three thousand five hundred dollars and we've also got this xl cabas um toffee bag for five thousand eight hundred pounds so clearly the stuff here isn't fucking cheap right um but loads of people have been loving loads of people have been lo liking it myself included and in a rare happenstance phoebe father decided to peek in front of the camera and grace us with her presence with a very 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 rare interview um unfortunately for you guys spoiler alert she didn't really say too much and i don't really mind it I'm a big fan of this interview or this kind of profile because if anything, Phoebe Philo kind of reminds me of Demna. And I'm going to tell you why when I read this piece. So the headline is Phoebe Philo breaks her silence. Um, courtesy of Vanessa Friedman, you know, I have my issues with her. I feel like she's a bit of a hater when it comes to streetwear. And sometimes I feel like she sometimes maybe doesn't even like black people. It feels like a little bit of dog whistling when she's like not liking streetwear stuff, but whatever. It is what it is. I pulled out to one side, but she is really a supreme fashion journalist regardless. So she wrote this piece. Um, let's start with the beginning. The last time Fever Philo has been called the Chanel of her generation gave a former interview was a decade ago. The designer whose work offered women respite from the limits of the male gaze has never been all that interested in explaining herself. She said, I say most of what I feel and most of what is worth me saying through what I make. We were sitting in a white black room um, that would be her new headquarters in Labrick Grove in London. From a hipster, from far from the hipster East End and the luxury stores of Bond Street, the office under construction contained not a single personal item, not even a marketing photograph on the wall. Um, her black nylon bomber rounded on the shoulders and cropped above the waist looked sort of like a small turtleneck shell into which she could withdraw and emerge at will. Under the bomber, she wore a grey pinstripe trousers and a matching overshirt. Um, her brown hair was pulled in a casual ponytail and she wasn't wearing any makeup. She's disinterested in artifacts as she is in oversharing. 
When Miss Philo speaks, she does so in elliptical phases. Uh, no, elliptical, sorry, elliptical phrases, using questions as openings to more questions. Though she became famous for transforming both Chloe and Celine, she walked away from the industry almost seven years ago and pretty much dropped out of sight, transformed into a myth practically overnight. Um, when she returned late last year under her own name, she did so to sky expectations with a succinct online only offering of her tra of her practical pieces for complicated characters who were unapologetical about their idiosyncrasies and inner lives. Quite a lot like the Phoebe herself, as she is generally referred to even by people who don't know her, in part because her clothes make them think that they know her. It's both her superpower and her curse. So basically she's saying, you motherfuckers don't know me. You think you know me through my clothes. You want to get to know me because of my clothes, but I don't give a fuck about you. Very Demna, very Hedy Slimane, you know, Hedy Slimane, um, Dior, Saint Laurent kind of era, even Celine era more so in terms of that, which I don't really mind to be fair. I'm not going to lie. I kind of like that kind of recluse genius who just pumps out the fucking gums, doesn't really say much or offer much to society apart from the making of the clothes. Um, critics and fashion insiders generally loved it. It almost all sold out in hours and then the complaining began. It was too expensive. The average bag price is around $5,000. The top end of the collection includes coats for $25,000. It wasn't surprising. You couldn't, you couldn't try anything on and a return policy was impossible. I had the absolute worst customer service, said Alexander um, Van Hoot, the founder of fashion search engine Tagwalk and a feeder fan who bought a dress on the day the brand appeared. Now, to be fair to this, to be fair, to be fair to her, to be fair to this, Phoebe Fowler has never been an accessible designer. From her time at Chloe, from her time at fucking Celine, she's always been designing for a certain level of woman. A, cert a woman that earns a certain amount of money, a certain stature, a certain class of a woman. So for people to suddenly accept or to suddenly expect her to come back into fashion after so many years spent out of it, which you would imagine all those years are spent out of it, she's not been making any money. She's probably been maybe consulting, maybe living off a of fucking savings. I don't really know. But to expect someone to come, you know, off of a, what, seven-year hiatus and to now be offering you fast fashion is absolutely insane. So people's expectations were way off when it comes to that regard. Now, the customer service sort of side of things, of course, that needs to be worked on. But most likely, they'll probably end up outsourcing that later on down the line. They probably don't really, you know, give a shit about that. If anything, it probably adds to the overall marketing and the kind of appeal and a buzz that you get such a shit experience online because it probably would echo the experience that you would get if you went to a retail store, which will probably happen soon as well, I think. I think most likely you'll see a retail store from Phoebe Philo very, very soon, like a flagship sort of like, you know, one-stop shop type of thing where mums can meet for like press, co like, you know, panel discussions about how to be a modern mum and all this sort of nonsense or whatever. I can see that happening. I can see like a goop type space, Phoebe Philo, you know, space happening soon in my personal opinion but who knows um anyway it continues which may be why as the second delivery arrives the phoebe Philo brand is really about comes further into focus phoebe Philo, the designer has decided it's time well not exactly explain herself but at least to open up a little bit so let's see what she has to say so that scarf pillow that scarf pillow thing actually looks really cool on it doesn't look great on the pictures i'm not gonna lie looking at the actual pictures of it on the web store it doesn't look that amazing but when you see it actually styled, especially on this young lady here in this fucking piece, it does look pretty cool. It kind of comes up way above your ears. It sort of drapes over your shoulders. It's not like a snood. It kind of fits really, really big. It's almost like a funnel neck type of thing. Um, the only problem is with someone like myself who's black and who sweats and who's very oily, uh, it's probably going to be covered in fucking stains on the inside. But imagine if you're a woman also who wears tons of makeup, you're probably going to have this inside looking like a fucking, you know, LGBTQ flag anyway. So it's probably not for the faint hearted. But imagine if you're a Phoebe Philo fan, the part of being a Phoebe Philo fan is that you encompass the whole brand. So maybe you don't wear a lot of makeup. You kind of do that whole fresh face, cold water, you know, type of, you know, French chic type of thing going on there. But I think that scarf looks really fucking cool. It's just a shame the price tag. The price tag is legitimately insane. 1,400 is wild. Um, it comes in one color, I'm assuming, right? Oh, it comes in the black as well. Okay. There's a black color too. Okay. It comes in a black color. 
Um, there's different sizing allegedly: small, medium, large. Uh, small, sorry, small, medium, and medium large. And there's also a description here that says like padded pillow scarf in a cream silk satin designed to be worn over the shoulders for a snug fit. But yeah, it looks fucking cool, really. There, it looks really cool there. Anyway, let's continue. Never explain. This is it. I don't feel that there's a huge amount of storytelling that needs to be done. Miss Philo, 50, said the subject was Miss Philo's reluctance to talk about her work and her plans and herself. I'm not particularly into that, she went. I don't feel myself that I need to, that I need a lot of, no, I, sorry, she says, I'm not particularly into that. I don't feel myself that I need a lot of that from other fashion houses. I feel that it's just not necessary. To a certain extent, you either like it or you don't. Someone telling me a story isn't going to make me like it more. It's a coat. It's a pair of trousers. I do appreciate a level of straightforwardness. You know what? I kind of fuck with her with that. I'm not going to lie. And that's part of, primarily one of the reasons why I love Demna. Demna, um, best era, obviously, being at Vetemar. The whole fucking, you know, premise of Vetemar is in the fucking name. Vetemar. Clothes, right? And the idea behind it was just presenting and putting out great fucking clothes. Season in, season out. A particular aesthetic, a particular type of tone, a particular type of mood, a particular type of attitude. But the clothes were the clothes. There wasn't really much else to be said for it. When Demna decided to get on his whole kind of like taking the piss out of fashion, smarmy, too, trying to be too smart for his own good type of thing. That's when the fashion glitterati kind of turned against him. With his type trying to like poke him fun at them and basically doing all these sort of like meta kind of, you know, messaging pieces within his fucking, you know, collections and shit. But by and large, people like myself just love Vetamon because of the fucking clothes. The clothes are fucking banging. Myself included, love people like Rick Owens, even though there's a lot of messaging, a lot of ideas, a lot of themes behind the stuff that he does, just because every season he's redefined he's kind of um he's kind of tightening up his messaging and his kind of output and kind of refining what he's basically doing um and the same thing could even be said for Hedy Semaine right Hedy Semaine at fucking Dior Hedy Semaine at Saint Laurent Hedy Semaine at fucking Celine if anything he's almost designing for the same person it's almost the same aesthetic but it's just kind of a continuation a continuing story of how to perfect the leather jacket a continuing story of how to perfect this particular suit, you know, style. A continuing story of how to protect, of how to perfect, sorry, a desert boot. How to perfect a trench coat. All these type of things. And I feel like those conversations, um, those stories are far more interesting than telling me this story about, you know, some small girl from a small town who crossed this river. That, you know, it's whatever. It's not some nonsense. But it does work for some people. I think those type, that type of theatrics or those type of those that type of storytelling obviously lends itself very well to couture um, because there's a lot more of a, there's a lot more of a dream that you have to kind of sell to the people and um, whatever it may be. But I think fashion by its very nature should just be about putting out the best clothes you can put out season in, season out and letting the chips fall wherever they may fall. I think that's what it should be about. I don't really think... If anything, nowadays, especially when you can f figure out, you know, how discerning customers are with the amount of kids that are on fucking fashion Twitter and shit, fashion Instagram, you know, breaking down, critiquing collections, people on TikTok and shit, people are really clocked in now. So if you do go out there trying to waffle, trying to spin things, you're going to get found out. So you're better off just making really cool shit and hoping people kind of like it. So I'm into this stuff. I'm not going to lie. I'm into her point of view. I like it. I like it. It continues. I never know what to expect, says Miss Philo. I feel like, who knows? I don't jump on the feedback immediately. With anything I do, I tend to naturally build in a little bit of distance, which probably is just self-protection. It's actually been something I think I've been practicing since childhood. Though some experiences, maybe relationships, maybe friendships, I learned can be uh, a good idea to just keep a bit of space between yourself, your inner self, sensitivities, and that stuff. In today's world, maybe it's necessary. She sounds a lot like me. This whole need to kind of compartmentalize, to box things, to distance things, to put things at arm's reach is a great way to deal with things. But I think nowadays, nowadays, I feel like it's incredibly important because there's just, I feel like if you're, if you're actually doing things, this is why I've kind of always believed Joe Rogan. Joe Rogan's got this kind of adage that he always says where he comments and says he never reads comments. I actually believe Rogan. There's not a lot of people I believe when they say they don't read comments, but I believe him. I feel like when you are producing 
podcasts at the level that Rogan is pro- producing them at, if you start reading comments, it's going to negatively affect the work that you do to the point where you probably won't be able to do it anymore. I feel like you kind of need to be in kind of go, go, go mode and just kind of hoping people kind of resonate and like what you have to say and not be really listening to all the praise or the fucking booing so that you can continue just pumping out those pods because after a certain time, you know, even I get bored of my own voice and I'm only 700 episodes in. This guy's like a thousand plus episodes in. So you can only imagine how much he's going to get bored of his voice, but you're only going to be get bored of your own voice or noticing those type of things when you start reading comments. So you kind of need to have a bit of distance so that you can kind of create, you can kind of pump out stuff and hopefully have that stuff resonate with people. And I feel like if you're a fashion designer, especially at this type of level, you probably do need to have that bit of distance so that you can create in the first place. Because if you keep getting, if you keep listening to the feedback, you're going to start having that play into your decisions of how you do certain things, which I feel like isn't true to your artistic vision or expression. If anything, people are going to come to Phoebe Philo, are going to come to a Ray Kawakubo, a Rick Owens, um, you know, a J.W. Anderson, because they want their particular expression. If, like, you don't want their expression plus your submission, plus your feedback, plus your insight. You want their expression unfiltered. So I think the best thing for it would be you create a space where the fans can... Because this is the one, this is the thing that I've always been a big believer in. I feel like fans should be able to say whatever the fuck they want and the creator should be able to do whatever the fuck they want. But you don't have to interact. If that makes any sense. It doesn't mean you have to think that you're bigger. The fan, the, the creator has to think that they're bigger than the fan. Or the fan has to think like they are the boss of the creator. I feel like they can both exist. I feel like if anything, the work kind of exists um, independent of both people. If anything. You create. You put the work out there. The fans absorb it or whatever. But you kind of both enjoy or don't enjoy it from a kind of a distance it's not really something that you kind of done in a weird way it sort of kind of appears out of out of the out of out of thin air kind of thing right and i think when you kind of create that sort of distance i feel like that's the best space to create the best work personally for me and i feel like her having this point of view is probably the best it's probably says a lot of why she come back into fashion because i feel like if she had to come back into fashion and play the game play the media game go go on podcasts go on live streams do kind of kind of open studio things she wouldn't have been able to do this she would have been like you know what fuck this i'd rather be consulting on a sly like most likely these big designers i would imagine when they're on the hiatus or retiring they probably do a lot of like you know um under the cover consultation where they go and work for h&m on the sly without getting credited and they basically just design a whole collection there without you fucking knowing that's what i think probably happens right um and you get probably paid a lot of money to do that sort of stuff but i feel like if she was if she wasn't able to come back on her terms she probably would have never come back so i feel like this way of working is the reason why we have to be followed back in fashion now it continues miss Philo is famously private she has never been on x or instagram or facebook or tiktok this i don't believe she's never been on it like, come on. She doesn't have an account, that's fair. But she's never been on those platforms, even just to browse. All right, come on, babe. Though she lives close to her office with her husband, Max Wigram, and their three children, daughter Maya, 19, and two younger sons, her homes, who also has one in the country, had never been photographed. So she actually is legitimately quite private, if you think for a fashion designer. Her home has never been photographed. We don't know the, the name of her two sons. And she doesn't, she does have a, a, a presence on social media. I don't even think the Phoebe Fowler brand has a social media account, does it? I don't think it does. Let's go back on the website. I don't think the website even has a, has even an Instagram. I think it's just a website. There's no fucking legit Instagram page for the actual brand itself. From what I can see on here anyway. Maybe I'm, maybe I'm mistaken, but here's the main website with all the fucking clothes on it. Yeah, there's no actual, there's, yeah, there's no actual fucking, yeah. There is none. Madness, isn't it? There's a subscribe button. There's images. There's a shop button. Login, but nothing. And bag, but no actual button here for the social media. So, okay. Maybe there's some truth in that. Maybe some truth. But I don't believe she's never been on X, Instagram, or Facebook. Even just a browse. That, that's ridiculous. She's definitely been on it, but maybe she doesn't have one. Fair. It continues. Um, though fine bonded and fragile, she can be immovable when she wants. 
It's tempting to see her tendencies to lean on jargony words like processing and learnings and her re and her refusal to engage with usual dance of publicity as deliberately obstructive, except that her close friends say that this is characteristic of how she interacts with the world. I've gotten used to how she communicates, says Bella Freud, the designer who's known Phoebe Fowler since she was at Chloe and who often meets her for long walks in one wood scrubs with the dogs. We rarely talk about fashion, more about thoughts, things to do with confidence, authenticity. It's almost like she's exploring the philosophy. I quite like the abstractness and it not demanding to know what she means. To be fair, if you're Phoebe Fowler's friend, you're not going to demand her to speak to you about fashion. Is it? The fact that she's your friend, you're just happy she's your friend. So asking her friends about her personality and shit is a bit of a waste of time because they're all probably lick ass, isn't it? For, you know, for lack of a better term. Um, Peter Miles, who worked with Miss Fowler for 10 years at Celine and helped create the identity of the Phoebe Fowler brand, agreed. She's never really wanted to give people what they want, or rather, she does not want to please, but not in the way that you expect to be pleased. So, there has to be, a, there has to be something to be said for this. I'm reading this. Why did she agree to do this? Then? She agreed to do this profile with New York Times, not to really say anything and just remind people she doesn't fuck with you. <laughs> Why is she probably doing this profile at New York Times then? She wanted to remind us all in full HD, in 4K, that, hey, by the way, I don't fuck with you. I make clothes. You either like it or you don't. If it's too much for you, get your money up. It is what it is. Like, if you don't like it, go buy something on Sheen. Do you know what I mean? Like, that's what she's basically doing. Um, when pushed about the groundswell of anticipation and fantasy surrounding her return, Miss Philo stared at the wall. There may have been an expectation that I could have provided everything to everybody immediately. And that's just not possible. It takes time and effort to make things that have meaning. One has to stand for something. Oh, okay, she's been a bit, you know. All right, Miss Fi All right, Miss Phoebe. I love you and stuff, but you need to relax. Um, if anything, I don't think she's ever stood for all women. That's the thing that I don't understand. I think maybe people misunderstood or maybe misinterpreted how she was at Celine. Because there was this idea at Celine that she was like, you know, pushing the idea of being a working mom, you know, giving birth to kids around the time that she was at Celine and, you know, navigating the fashion industry while trying to be a quote unquote regular mom. I can understand why some women kind of resonated with her with that because in fashion, the idea of kind of being young or ever young um, and being free of kids and shit and being hot and skinny are probably a lot of things that women kind of struggle with. But that vision of a woman that she was kind of designing for was basically her and that, that type of woman is still a one percenter right like very affluent very well educated uh, lives in a great house kids go to great schools husband has a great job like these aren't regular people like what does phoebe follow husband actually do and, I, and actually let's see phoebe follow husband who is he who's max wigram max wigram is a is famously private um, no, okay, we don't know much about his... What, what does Max Wigman do? Let's see what he does. Wax, Max Wigman is what? What does he do? Uh, we don't actually know much about him, okay. Falls back in love with Max Wigman. There's not much about him on here. No idea what he does. He might have a company's house somewhere, but there's no... He's part... Maybe he does some book shit. Maybe just a private dude. We don't know. We don't have a clue. But let's. it's safe to say... That he probably doesn't come from a council estate in East London, right? It's probably safe to say that this guy does not come from a council estate in East London like I do. No way, Jose. So if that's the case, I don't know. What people would expect her to do? She expected to come back and make clothes for like what? Mums who live on fucking Instagram and social media. Like, probably not, right? Probably mums who like, you know, go to private members clubs or who go to lunch at Chiltern Firehouse and go have walks in warm with scrubs with their fucking designer dogs and their big designer prams and their nice big coats and shit like this is a whole different world so i don't know maybe i'm confused let's continue here this is a really great picture there wow look at that bag amazing um the new bean bag in calf leather what does philip Faber stand for um this is how philo describes her own work which involves loose jeans that unzip to the rear of the back caveman trousers and coats covered in shaggy embroidery and high collar almost military trenches and a pillowy scarf um, that looks like a cross between a giant padded donut and a neck brace it's very intuitive she says a response to what i see around me how i see the women dressing and how i feel myself 
my relationship with clothes. She is not, she said, one of those designers who tries everything on, but she does think, can I imagine wearing it? Will it be comfortable? How does it feel? She doesn't try things on. She doesn't even check Instagram. Like this woman's weird, isn't it? Imagine designing clothes and not trying them on. So what? You just like look, look, look at them on a fit model and that's it. Huh. Rivy Rogers, a chief and co-founder of River Cafe in London, who has, oh, she, of course she goes to the River Cafe. Of course Phoebe Filer goes to the River Cafe. This makes a lot of sense. Who's known Filer for decades is one of the women who wears it. She said that once she discovered Phoebe Filer and Celine, basically that's all I wore. And now she's a Phoebe Filer customer. She bought pieces from the first collection because she said they were clothes for a woman who doesn't want to be sexualized, but they don't deny her sexuality. Of course. So imagine a woman that would dine at the River Cafe at lunchtime on their own, reading a book. Yes. That's the kind of person who'd be into this sort of stuff. But big up Phoebe Filer. That, that bomber jacket in the interview looks fucking sick to be fair. I actually would like to, I'm not sure if that's out yet, but that bomber jacket is amazing. It's got this really elongated, exaggerated collar. It's almost Sakai style with the collar. Um, really exaggerated collar, short boxy design according to the interviewer, um, over like a blazer and some trousers. She looks really great. She's got great personal style herself, to be fair. Um, Sandra Huller, the actress um, from Anatomy of Four, is the only recognizable face in a brand new imagery, she, uh, which also features a close-up of a bare belly with the pregnancy stretch marks and fleshy rolls and some shimmy feet and cut off in the knees so you can see the dancing of a leather fringe mules. Miss Fowler views her work as one continuous collection and does not believe in seasons, which is why she prefers the word edit and divides the edits into deliveries. Delivery one of edit two is on sale now and delivery two is planned to arrive at the end of March. When the terminology was first introduced, along with the statement that the brand intentionally um, made less than anticipated demand, there was wide interpreted as a strategy to calculate to drum up extreme FOMO which it is I wish they'd just be honest and say it is please you don't intentionally make less things because you just want to make less things you do it because you want to fucking drum up interest and you want to create scarcity and you want there to be an anticipation for the stuff to drop and blah 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 that's perfectly fine but let's not lie and say oh because of certain manufacturing techniques and it's just like come on bro come on Miss Philo said that it was actually not the aim. Of course she said that. The point was to create a baseline data to help her figure out how much she would need to produce to satisfy her market without ending up with lots of liquid. Okay, maybe that's maybe there is both both parts are true. Maybe it was done. They created less quantities to drum up interest, but also to make sure they didn't have a lot of dead stock left that they had to kind of burn um, or, or throw in the ocean and have a turtle choke on it. To encourage customers to build a coherent wardrobe slowly over time, that's why customers were asked to sign up via email to be alerted about deliveries. I don't know why there was such a big, um, why there has, to, sorry, I don't know why there has to be such a, a beginning and an end of our industry. I don't know why it can't just be continuous. I agree. But to be fair, it can't be continuous because most people can't afford to be continuous. They have to come really hard, which is kind of weird to say, pause, but they have to come super hard in the beginning and then hope they can just ride that wave. Um, they don't really have the opportunity or the chance that she has because of the goodwill she's you know built over, over the years, because of her undeniable talent, because of the investment with LVMH, all this malarkey. You can take more chances. You can kind of do stuff in your in a unique way because you're kind of a, a bit of a unique talent in that regard. There are some people in the industry who can kind of call their own, you know, who can make their own demands um, as it may be, but most people probably can't. It continues. Miss Fala knows that she has to move product. She's not naive. And in any case, she and her husband are the majority owners of the business. So it's her money on the line. Elvia makes a luxury group. Uh, was her employer, Celine, has a minority stake. So her and her husband have put all her money's savings into it, plus the investment to LVMH to make this fucking work. So I guess the husband must be like the business guy. He must be her Gorham. Hopefully they don't break up and he doesn't end up making his own brand. That'd be hilarious. But I guess uh, if he be follows Demler, uh, Max Wigram is Gorham. It continues. Um, I still don't believe it needs to be like that. I continue to wear clothes today that I've had for 20 years. One of my favorite pairs of trousers is a pair of Chloe trousers I made. They're important to me, these pieces. I don't want to get rid of them. So we have so, so, so what we have now is a body of work over a year and it's all connected. Her children support her work, she says, but they're not fans of it at all. My daughter has a couple of pieces. She's really sweet. Sometimes she'll say, oh, mom, can I get that? But they don't mention it that much. Their algorithm isn't vibing with me. I fucking love that. 
That gave me some vibe with me. Good great picture of her there leaving at the end of a show for Celine. Doing it her way. When Miss Philo left fashion, there was a general sense of mourning and tendency to see it as an indictment of the system. The amorphous force that abuses creativity in the name of commerce. After all, she was the first designer to take um, maternity. What? I didn't know that. She was the first designer ever to take maternity leave. <laughs> that's fucking crazy you know the fashion industry is fucking insane no wonder designers are leaving their post left and right the wonder people get fired so quickly this this industry doesn't even doesn't even right the fashion industry is basically built on women it's built by women it's built for women and they don't even do best they don't even do right by the women who basically are the lifeblood the fucking you know the foundation of the fucking industry they don't even let them go on fucking maternity leave. God damn. Um, when she, so yeah, she was the first uh, she was the first designer to ever take maternity leave when she was at Chloe and at Celine. She used to she used to muse backstage about the joys of disappearing into the country. She seemed to need fashion less than fashion needed her. Celine was wonderful, she said. It was an incredibly important experience in my life, but she wanted to live and examine life and she didn't think that she could figure out what that might mean when she was committed to something else. The first year away, she was in the middle of moving, so she focused on that and hanging out with her family and fielding headhunter calls. She won't name Boss Brand. She considered activism, non-profits. She, I've always told my children, the more you mess about, the more you find out, she said, using a future term than mess. Oh, okay. So I guess fuck about find out. I love this. I love this about her. You know, fuck about find out. Quite frankly, I realized that work was something I needed. And I think I had a sense it was actually going to be within fashion. Even if she knew she didn't want to go back to what she had done. In most big houses, designer jobs end at the runway. They don't oversee ad campaigns or the merchandise of the store design. Miss Philo wanted to have fingers in all of that. Even if independence and startup meant not flying first class or having drivers or lots of orchids in the office. Okay, so it sounds like they're trying to position this as this Phoebe Philo brand is like a small startup, right? I like what they're doing here. They're trying to make it seem like she's making this stuff all out of her own fucking living room, which is hilarious. When she's really got all the infrastructure, all the manufacturing, all the partners necessary in LVMH, especially to basically trot out like high level fashion shit, right? At that kind of level, especially taking so many years out. So the fact that they're trying to make it seem like she's fucking sewing this shit herself in a living room is fucking hilarious. Fundamentally, but you know, fashion, we love these stories. We love these fucking myths. We love to lionize people. And this is one of them fundamentally that is not the stuff that makes me happy miss Fano said the stuff that makes her happy involves baking galleries riding clubbing she goes clubbing phoebe follows in the club shit if i see phoebe follow a fucking inferno or i see a fold or i see a fucking unfold or hot box yeah or hole like what really phoebe follows in the clubs sick her family and friends. She said she's constantly walking the tightrope between ensuring downtime and discovering inspiration. Once she knows she can trust you, there are no barriers, Miss Rogers says. After Miss Rogers' husband, the architect Richard, Richard Rogers, fell during a trip in Mexico and was hoping to for months, Miss Philo came over for breakfast one day wearing a big tweed coat Miss Rogers admired. She took it off and gave it to me, Miss Rogers said, and refused to take it back. It kept me safe and warm since. Oh, that's fucking beautiful. Edward Innerford, the former editor of British Vogue, who's been a friend of Miss Philo since they were kids in West London, said he used to bug her endlessly about when she would make menswear. I've always expected I would buy one of women's coats and get it tailored, he said. Yeah, especially Edward Inderfo. He needs, you know, he's a he's a big boy. He's a big boy. He needs, he's a big boy, that one. Then just before the Fashion Awards in London last year, she presented him with a grey double-breasted suit just because she wanted me to feel good about myself. I always wear black. I had never worn grey in my life, but I trusted her. It was very liberating. Oh, so that's a Phoebe Fowler designed men's suit. Fair play. With a pair of Sambas on bit cringe but you know big up edward miss Fowler knows that the usual designer trajectory is a start of bare bone brand um show that you can do the get so miss Fowler knows that the casual the usual designer trajectory is to start a bare bones brand show that you can do and then get a golden ring to a big job with a fat contract but she said doing it the other way around was the answer to her questions oh i love this it's kind of like my idea of when I always start a fashion brand. I was thinking of doing a di um, a diffusion line first, and then head you know ringing it up into the main line. 
that would kind of be the way I kind of wanted to do it. Like start with accessories and then go to ready to wear. Um, how can I do my best work? What is my potential? How can I have the most responsive um, relationship with the world and where we're living in today? She won't articulate it exactly, but she's effectively trying to retrain people in how to shop and how to think about what they buy. She's a pioneer, says Mr. Innerfor, and pioneers always take the heat. Okay, there's a little bit too much going on here about her. Be like, let's let's relax. You know what I mean? She's got her own store. She sends out direct to consumer, but it's not as if she's fucking designing microchips and stuff. You need to relax. Um, my learning curve has never been greater, says Miss Philo. I think people imagine that somehow we've been quietly building a huge organization, but I maybe have two members of staff. Okay, that's pretty cool. I like that. I like that she's kind of made. To be fair, I like that, that she's basically proving you can run a company like this without having an bloated staff members, um, massive offices designed by world famous architects, interior designers. It doesn't necessary. You can obviously run, especially if you've got LVMH. That's the one thing people are forgetting. The LVMH partnership makes it easy because they can do all the actual grunt work while you have to kind of just focus on the quote unquote design and the fun stuff. Um, you would imagine, or the brand facing stuff, right? They can f f focus on the nuts and bolts shit that probably a lot of people don't really think about and um, procurement, all that sort of shit. It continues. Um, I think people imagine that somehow we would have been quietly building a huge organization, but I had maybe two members of staff and I'm involved in renting space, buying office furniture. She currently has about a hundred employees. Okay. She made it seem like she, had, <laughs> what? <laughs> so she's like, okay, I guess, anyway, I guess a hundred employees also includes LVMH, but I love how they say two members of staff and then she says a hundred employees. Okay, cool. Mr. Miles was one of the people who contacted who she contacted earlier on when she was forming the idea of what her brand might be. They talked about it. He said for maybe two years about the meta issues of what means to translate your name from something personal to something corporate, from something of your own to something everyone can own. I toyed with the idea of made up names. Oh. Some words are satisfying to say. Some of them are really rude as well. There was really good swear words. So I guess she wanted to make some separation between keeping Phoebe Philo the person and the brand or, or and the brand personal to her. But then at some point you have to kind of cash in on that cachet and use that brand name recognition as part of the fucking marketing or as part of the drive to kind of roll out your brand and hope people that trusted you at Celine, at Chloe will now trust you with your own namesake brand. So I get that. I kind of like that she went with her own name brand because I feel like having a jacket with her label with her name on it, on the inside, is probably one of the hardest things ever. And obviously, the picture of there, they're sitting on the table wearing that amazing bobber jacket. Um, but in the end, Miss Philo says there was something straightforward about using my own name. Um, for all the talk about paying attention to the outside noise around the business, Miss Philo knows some things have to change. They are working on smoothing out the returns policy, offering more ways to pay and altering subscribers when a piece they like is back in stock. As the collection gets fuller, there'll be greater range of prices with some jersey pieces that are relatively more affordable. The intention really is that the pieces stick around for a while. They have to be made well and they have to be considered and that tends to come at a certain price point. During COVID, which coincided with her planning and shopping habits had changed in a way that she was working to her advantage because she meant that she could start without a store but she doesn't intend to keep it that way oh great i'd love to hear this I, i'm really curious to see what a phoebe fellow store looks like like i said i've got a vision of it being like a group a group type headquarters where there could be loads of wellness health sort of shit going on for like young mums or young professional women in general um it'll be a great way to kind of propagate that sort of propaganda in general i feel like that'll work really well um it continues by so much hopes to open a some uh open some store of physical space maybe temporary maybe not first in new york then london why new york i huh, wonder why new york first there may be even a show in time but right now she said in today's world there's so much fashion so much big fashion i try to remember that most of the big houses started with one human being who had an idea about what they wanted to do exactly i love that line at the end though because that's something i remember steve jobs saying which is one of my favorite inspiring motivational quotes like you know most of bi most big ideas out there start off with one person just having the idea and these people are no smarter or better than you or i so if they can do it you can do it also so i love the fact that she's kind of had that kind of thinking going forward so great to see she's in it for the long term i think some of the lionization in the article is a little bit much to be fair but again it's phoebe philo she's a big deal and um, everybody's been excited to have her back in fashion so it's no surprise people kind of really kind of sucking her off but 
really interesting article um she probably didn't say too much to be completely fair but it's phoebe philo things it's phoebe philo things and of course i'll put the link in the description for those of you that want to check it out um and obviously in the stream chat for those of you want to see it yourself and you can read the article in full if you may please you can read the article in full if you may please